Hello everyone, today we talk about the Khanate of the Golden Horde and the rise of the Duchy of Moscow. I think this is the first video I make on medieval Russian history on Schwerpunkt, aside from um, I think Russian tactics uh, between the 14th, 15th century, so that's a strictly military history video, if you're interested that's exactly fitting into today's timeline, so if you're interested in warfare and you want to know a bit more about this world, um, through you know, even through tactics, through warfare, you can really say a lot like I did in that video on gen in general for, in, for what concerned Russian society and in its interaction with the um, the Tartars uh, at that point, and uh, nevertheless, um, this is more of a kind of a general history video. Um, it's not going to be even precisely, you know, in, in, in detail, looking at the various stages of the expansion of the Duchy of Moscow, which has definitely a very interesting history. Instead, you know, that Moscow rose from uh, essentially. Um, was a kind of a very secondary um, um, principality among the various Russian uh, in the, within the Russian world that, however, managed to develop thanks to its kind of even exactly for because of its decentralized position in this kind of more wilder area, also quite a forested region. Uh, the Mongols had um, when invading Russia, and they had uh, even destroyed, I think, initially the, the original settlement, I think it was in 1234, 1238, uh, I don't remember when, when it was in, in Moscow, but nevertheless, that, that's a position from which the local um, nobility managed to, to uh, very cleverly, as we will see today, uh, to expand um, between a world that was um, very peculiar, because the, the background is essentially this Russia um, fragmented essentially in this myriad of principalities that now were practically revolving around um, the Mongol uh, dominion that we'll see now, the Golden Horde in Sarai, centered in Sarai, um, and being in, in this sense client states of the Mongols and receiving also an enormous amount of influence. Um, as we we have seen also in, in that in that video on on Russian tactics at this time, um, the uh, you have to think really that when it comes to material culture and also many other, the, the, there was a great homogeneity in 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 many ways. Also, I, I was very interested in the military. Um, uh, especially the military equipment, uh, not because I, I know much about it, but because I believed that the Russians at that time, um, in their iconographic sources, were sticking sometimes to certain ideal models that were continuing a tradition of um, Byzantine iconography. Uh, the um, the Russians at this time were still in, in contact with uh, the Eastern Roman Empire, though they uh, objectively, uh, you know, at this point the, the empire was kind of declining. It's where today we're going to discuss essentially from the uh, from the 13th uh, up to the 15th century. So, a moment in which naturally Constantinople had been conquered by the Crusaders, were with, with, with great difficulty reconquered by the Palaiologoi dynasty. So, a moment in which definitely it was not like back in the day in the 9th 10th century when the russians were um uh, you know uh, so strictly and directly in contact with the byzantines initially you know fighting against them then eventually becoming their allies um the um the same fragmentation of russia and and the decline of the byzantine empire are this kind of uh, evident elements uh, surely also under the mm, the uh, the kievan rus um so in this moment in which um the Principality of Kiev um, uh, had this, you know, greater influence on the Russian world. This was still fragmented. It was essentially a cluster of principalities, but um, this system was kind of also more, um, uh, I can't say necessarily more inter intertwined than it would be in these later times. But at, at least, uh, at least uh, up to the moment in which the Principality of Kiev was kind of fit and in shape from a political social point of view that these were you know this was a an entity that had a also wide range um uh influence you know after all these guys had managed uh kind of out of the blue to 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 assemble a fleet to go assault Constantinople definitely yeah it, it wasn't a um eventually any great accomplishment but i mean the idea the idea even of you know thinking yourself in that position and also strengthening eventually this 
ties with um, the court of Constantinople, um, all the benefits that derive from this organization of the local church now that was of the uh, ev evangelized Varangians was, you know, part of a great um, uh, ideology that is essentially what survived. This is a very important um, part of this history is that nevertheless, in, in spite of, let's say, this um, ties between the Byzantine world and the Russian world at this point being kind of, you know, thinned um, by the, the events, by the uh, sheer impossibility of keeping, you know, a direct um, interaction of if not for, for chiefly from a cultural point of view, um, the ideology of the uh, principality of the great of what would have uh, become eventually of the uh, with the Grand Duchy of the Muscovy as the uh, the sovereign the sovereign of all the Rus, mm, um, it kind of remained. Mm. So this idea, this Eastern Slavic land of the Rus. Um, um, was not forgotten as such. It uh, doesn't matter how much these lands had um, uh, the, the, the had been fragmented, how also feudalism kind of increased because Kiev had managed uh, initially to create a statal entity that was br very remarkable considering the times and spaces uh, at the time. Um, and this had all fragmented. It was, uh, however, always the ideal that had to be a sort of sovereign uh, ruler of the Rus, that the Rus were uh, an entity that would, with a history, with a tradition, uh, um, and that theoretically this had to be ruled by a unique ruler. And definitely back in the day, previous to the Mongol conquest, nobody would have even imagined that it would have been that that settlement there lost in the forest in, in the northeast of Moscow that would have rise to this uh, uh, point. But this is also, I, I would say, yeah, the paths of history and how these things happen. And um, there is always a reason that that's why we study history because we want to really to understand how how it developed. Um, uh, w what I was saying before is, excuse me, I, I digressed once again. Is that I was inter interested, especially in. Uh, in in the Russian uh, military equipment, because seemingly the the Russians at this time were sticking still to the Byzantine models, these heroic, especially warrior saints, pictures that were highly uh, classical in look, very you know in this sense very fictional in, in many ways. And instead, what it's beautiful to stress, in my opinion, at this point, these Russian principalities was nothing but you know the the at the at the uh, client states. Uh, um, buffer states at a uh, at the outskirts of a huge Mongolian empire that uh, osmotically influenced enormously these centers. Um, it would have been relatively difficult to distinguish uh, also certain characteristics between the two. Um, the the Russians at this point have this great acceleration also in, in warfare towards something that is almost the identical copy of the, the Mongol armies, in a way, also in tactics. Think about this time, also the Battle of Kulikovo that gave this, this mythical battle that was, um, you know, showing essentially the Russians, giving them the, the hope of um, um, being uh, kind of a autonomous population, a free population from the, you know, shaking off the Tatar uh, yoke at this point, and it was carried out by tactics were extremely similar to the Mongol ones. So um, this is a very interesting, in my opinion, overlooked um, historical setting that uh, I also would like to know more, kind of, to, to, to um, express it better. Today, as we were saying before, uh, I will keep it simple. I will not look at the, you know, step by step the stages of the um, Muscovite expansion, um, but we're going to look at the essentials to 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 really give an idea of what, especially the relation between the um, the Russian princes, not just the Muscovite ones, actually, what were with, with the Golden Horde and how eventually this area was, you know kind of transform and set in motion chiefly by the rise of the uh, Duchy of of, um, of Moscow. So, first of all, a, a bit of a geographical picture of this thing, you know, the, 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 the Khanate of the Golden Horde, so it, it was called like this, so it was this, um, let's say, 
kind of successor state of the, the Mongol Empire, when the, the, the empire had basically split into these various khanates. Uh, this is something huge. If you look at on the map, um, Europe bordered with this enormous um, center um, of the Golden uh, the, this um, enormous empire of the Golden Horde. Uh, Vu's capital was centered in Sarai, mm, on the low Volga, and that covered basically uh, almost of all the territories um, north of the Black and the Caspian Seas, the region of the Urals, Kazakhstan, and also a great part of the western Siberian um, uh, plains. And so, this you, you, you imagine, naturally, these were regions that were kind of very um they were not ex extremely developed i mean these centers were that there were these major centers especially sarai on the volga they, they were m usually trade centers that had developed around it this great russian rivers um and and that uh, really were living in, in this world was a bit halfway between you know the sin Terrorized world and the uh, the step one on the step. Um, naturally, Russia and the um, the Russians, in fact, this this, uh, this Slavic population inhabited mostly the uh, the region of the forests. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the uh, historically speaking, the steppes had in the south had always been more you know um, uh, you know wiped by these uh, these populations of nomad nomadic populations kind of uh, strolling. Um, the uh, Eurasian steppes, and and uh, from which the, the Mongols, in fact, had come and seized uh, the centers. So it was a very interesting world, also because it was not at all isolated. It was a very dynamic world. Um, it was full of Western merchants at this point. Um, the these great rivers were really a kind of major highways of the trade of the time. Uh, the Russian uh, timber. Um, uh, and uh, amber and and fours and, and all were were all you know kind of part of the um, of the Western trade. Uh, the the kind of arrived up to the West. You know, in the Black Sea, there were we've seen it recently with the Italian maritime republics. There were Genoese colonies. These uh, exported the goods um, eventually into Western Europe. Um, there was also a great connection with other markets of the Middle East, and some of them reached up to to China definitely so um, these were lands that had a, a, actually a great potential also in terms of um, sheer amount of uh, uh, of uh, raw uh, material uh, in, in practice and it was and, and Russia since this very early age kind of begins to um, to to be a, a, a very important for this very international scale exports you know, in the Ukrainian uh, grain is something that was exported at this point extensively, also in the West, towards the late Middle Ages and beyond. You know, the you know the Russian grain was exported as far as um, as uh, as uh, the Barian Peninsula. There was also this trade that basically um, crossed the the, from the Baltic Sea and then the North Sea, from, you know, in, in involved England, um, the Asiatic League, and this. Baltic countries and uh, all for you know getting the resources of Russia that in this sense was growing also uh, under under this point of view albeit being an area that up to that point had not been very developed as you can imagine but it's also thanks to the developments of such principalities and the emergency of the Moscovy that this um, wealth is kind of uh, progressively framed into the hands of uh, collecting into the hands of a few that are able to build something more consistent and that uh, will rise to be you know the Tsarist Russia as uh, we have known it uh, historically um, so the, the Khanate of the Golden Road was pretty big was a pretty big thing and it was no surprise that these um, fragmented principalities that uh, had uh, in fact, split. I mean, this Russian world that lived at uh, at its outskirts would be so massively influenced, especially now that after the Mongol invasion had been um, overly fragmented, having also lost part of the kind of the bigger chunk. It was the um, the Kievan one. Uh, 
uh, at this point had been uh, had kind of vanished um, so now naturally the balance of power was being shifted also towards this other small centers and in many ways also from a cultural point of view that the problem of the centrality of the or, or, uh, of the Russian church now was also pretty pretty important we'll see how the church was um, uh, also very instrumental for the development of the Duchy of Muscovy and it was uh, strangely also pretty much you know not so much perhaps uh, also mm, kind of mm, tolerated if not favored by the Golden Horde as uh, as an institution in these um, in these Russian principalities into which naturally the, the Tatars intervened as we will see now so from the mid 13th century the uh, Mongol hegemony um, I'd say Mongol, you know, the Mongols of the Golden Horde are also called are Tatars or Tartars, as you want to call it. Um, so the the, the Mongol the Mongol hegem hegemony was possible, um, w you know, was was practically carried out through the control of these Russian princes. Hmm. Every Russian prince at this point had to personally uh, respond to the uh, can of Sarai of his of his own uh, political activity and of the men that were under him as this was a feudal system so he was not just aware of you know uh, swearing not of allegiance as it was done you also had to check you know that your um, you know that your vassals behaved and didn't uh, interfere also with the Tatar affairs this is kind of interesting because there's many times in history when there is a, a major empire that controls these fragmented areas there is always the, the same the politically fragmented areas there is always the tendency to um, for, from this great empire to kind of find more privileged interlocutors in this situation and partially to, to strengthen them mm -hmm. the same Duchy of Moscow rose um, mostly thanks to the cooperation with the Mongols that gave them as we'll see now also many privileges and power to you know to be the favorite uh, referentiaries we can say in this otherwise very um, difficultly controllable world mm. um, so the uh, the the say divide et impera is not always true because certain um, po more fragmented political entities can be more difficultly uh, controlled if if they are so uh, divided and and you need sometimes something bigger that can control better the situation so this really depends on on on, on the particular context and every one of these um, Russian princes just to make you understand how tight and dependent they were from the candidate of the Golden Horde basically had to receive a written uh, recognition of his own lordship from the court of Sarai mm -hmm. so this um, this Russian principality is basically um, from uh, at least from a Mongol perspective it existed because of the will of the of the Khan mm -hmm. so these were not free They're, they were technically dependent on it and he could move uh, also war against them naturally as you can imagine or maybe just as it happened several times to to send other to legitimate other russian principalities to assault you know the the, the rebel in 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 this way um so from from a local there was also a lot of local control hmm? the tatar uh, supremacy at a local level was um expressed um, um, especially at a, at a political and military level um, by um, sending essentially a um, can's uh, lieutenant with a with an army on its own with a contingent on its own and uh, exercising a right of military levy on the Russian populations mm -hmm. so every um, Russian prince at this point had this was controlled by this uh, Mongol officers, a uh, Mongol officer and um, and military uh, garrison that um, controlled essentially the moves of these uh, of the Russians and on and, and especially and this was basically what 
in a nutshell, uh, every empire is is based on. There was a very heavy, um, at least in that case, a very heavy uh, taxation. Mm -hmm. So the collection of the tributes was uh, usually entrusted to certain Mongol functionaries, or they um, were um, kind of um, um, subcontracted essentially to certain foreigners or even in lesser measure to uh, the locals. Mm -hmm. This is very important because uh, in many times, you know, this in many cases, this, and in these times, it tax collection was usually entrusted to people who were uh, to certain communities who were already kind of uh, involved into money lending and this kind of organizational ability, chiefly merchants mm -hmm. and th this was mm, kind of profitable because from one side basically you didn't as a Mongol Khan you didn't have to develop an extremely um, costly bureaucracy or status system, but you could just rely on people that were already present on the territory, like these merchants that we discussed before, that were present in this time, also from from Europe in this and uh, these main centers, and that had, in this sense, no particular affiliation, no particular feeling or uh, or, or bond with the, the locals, um, so that they already care to, to cash and to do it uh, on behalf of this authority that granted them also protection, we can imagine, uh, military scores and so on. Even though um, also some Russian uh, princes were sometimes entrusted this um, duty of tax collection and this could be done and we will see, especially in the, in the case of the Dutch of Moscovy, this was granted as one of the major um, benefits for having you know assisted the Mongols in battle and having um, essentially repressed other Russian rebels. Excuse me, I drink a little bit. And as you can imagine, it was also very strong political and military interaction of the Mongols with the Russians, meaning that the Russians fought uh, together and for the Mongols also. And this is not a matter of, you know, say, you know, from one side the word the Russians, from one side the word the Tatars, also because even though the Golden Khanate was pretty, you know, consistent also as, as an entity, it, it wasn't so directly centralized. In fact, when we talk about the Khanate of the Golden Horde, we, it's not that these were actually all the Mongols, these were kind of foreign rulers coming from Mongolia, in fact, on certain nomadic populations that inhabited those areas of the steppes that were now framed into this Mongol Empire but were also kind of tribes on their own. Um, so in, in this Mongol world, and especially at its, uh, at its outskirts, uh, there were actually f uh, it was actually plenty of several tribes that were also difficultly controllable by the, the, the same Tatars. There were certain um, um, tribes of mm, Turkic origin that um, were kind of um, settled also in Russia by the same Russian princes and that distinguished them uh, from you know these foreign elements of of Mongolia that uh, you know and these were called something like our own pagans in Russian that is essentially you know these peoples that had already dwelled. Um, just outside of the Russian forests and were now it had been for centuries heavily interacting with, with the Russians more or less friendly but th at this point were considered as something on their own because they had kind of always been there wh whereas the Mongols had kind of come once uh, in a day literally out of the uh, of, of, of the blue of this and and uh, having imposed this massive system that however uh, also was not ex excessively centralized and at the same time sa and obviously the Russian world was not centralized at all um, on the contrary the the, s the Mongol invasion had um, I've discussed actually now remember that I've discussed these things pretty extensively on that um, on that video made on Russian tactics during the 14th to 15th century there is this very strong increase you see it from from warfare this very strong increase of feudalism 
the uh, the Kievan Rus had kind of tried to stem partially also the emergence of very powerful dynasties in this area. Now there was no central rule, or if not this, you know, kind of um, very strong influence from the Khanate, and the the various lords, the various Russian princes had kind of um, increased very much their authority over the uh, traditional organization levies uh, of the uh, of the militia for instance that up to a certain point had been very important as uh, the the Kievan Rus back in the day um, meant as a period not just as the, the the principality of Kiev but also in the rest of Russia had seen a also decent um, you know consistent development of um, kind of middle classes so merchants um, and um, also here these classes, these centers that are formed in the, uh, along these major uh, waterways of the Russian um, of the Russian plains that were extremely profitable for trade and so on. Now it's as if with the Mongol invasion there was a sort of um, very strong feudalization. Mm -hmm. um, there had indeed been a, a very strong economical crisis uh, followed the the Mongol invasion. I mean there were many, there had been many destructions. So um, it's as if uh, it, this is something that happens often historically speaking, sometimes in, a, in less traumatic, less sudden ways. But let's say it's as if all the the, the middle classes had impoverished and they had necessarily sought the protection of these major leaders that were framed, in fact, within a hierarchy that was ideally within the same canate of the Golden Horde, that had a very strong hierarchical um, ideal from you know from the imperial. Uh, models of the Mongols, for which there is this kind of even kind of uh, I can say monotistic um, authority. But I mean the idea that also in the organization there is this decimal base from which uh, at the top there is the greater Canada also has certain divine meanings. So um, it it had been the same Mongols that had favored, as we have seen, the rise of certain dynasties to control better s such areas of the. Of Russia. Um, so a, a great social change, you know, that the, the, the Mongol invasion in in Russia has been definitely a very traumatic event. It has really reversed the tides in, uh, in many many ways. It was traumatic also for other countries were surrounding, um, uh, like I don't know, for for Poland, for for Hungary, but Russia was the one that, in this sense, was framed also within. The Khanate itself and absorbed the most from it, under so many, so many points of view. Um, so once again, I realized I hadn't finished the point before <laughs> about the Russian equipment. I want I want to say is that probably even the Russian army at this point looked uh, something extremely close to the to the Mongol one in terms of equipment and so on, in spite of what iconography show us iconography of these Russian icons and you know and many other um, sources shows us this still kind of Roman like classical like um, models of Byzantine uh, derivation but um, if we had seen I don't know the, the Russian army at Kulikovo you might have seen how it was it remarkably close in look um, to, to a Mongol one and also the same time you, you realize it from the composition really if anything, because it was plenty of Mongols also in the Russian armies by themselves, and there were many also Mongol, um, I would say better Tatar chieftains that also passed, um, you know, to to become eventually with the rise of these certain principalities, sometimes within the, uh, the the domination of this principality eventually, and there were there was also the integration part of Tatar nobility, a certain. Russian nobility at one point was practically uh, descended from certain Mongol chieftains that had been integrated because there was a sheer matter of you know uh, of including these um, elements to to grow stronger in the military and polygraphy and it was all about this. I mean, there is a sometimes in history this this is also typical of Europe in many ways, but it can be seen in here that um, mm, mm, it's beautiful. I mean, in, we in our modern view we have mm, the idea that the big empire that is all homogeneous, all kind of a unitary thing, is kind of the best thing because it's allegedly easier to control. Everything is fine, but uh, I tell you the truth, many times in history, a great development 
um, also in civilization, stemmed exactly from these fragmented situations. Because it's as if a, a larger state, a bigger empire, kind of burns more in terms of resources and, 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 and wastes also more than them in attrition and is, um, is much more likely to impoverish on the long run the various uh, entities. Whereas you ha when you have all these so many little states that of, of course that it's terrible because they all fight against each other everything is pretty messy but at the same time within these states you see that there is a much higher degree of of develop development individually speaking just think of what it meant to live in in 14th or 15th century Russia among all these various principalities and all the various uh, all the uh, need um, you had for essentially just think about diplomacy. You know, diplomacy could have not developed in in Europe at, at the f I don't know so so much in the 15th century if Europe had not been fragmented so much. This continuous need to know what your neighbor was up to, um, what they were projecting, whether it was a m military threat, what, what their m economical policy was, you know, what they could. Um, it, it it teaches you to reason. Um, uh, to to develop your critical thinking, to 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 look at a system that is much more complicated that you have to really apply very seriously to understand to figure out how it works, and these are all things that produce a lot of um, a lot of civilization proper, because it makes your brain work essentially to figure out what the best situation uh, solution is. Um, it also produces this constant fear, because naturally the more the system is fragmented, the more you need um uh um you your 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 uh, the situation is unstable so you have to figure out constantly um without uh, ever lowering the guard what what the next thing is going to uh, it's going to be and how you have to cope with it you it teaches you to be always kind of trying to be one step in advance because um you 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 realize that kind of the worst things can happen from a moment to another you have to be ready for it so um even if this, in, in this case, especially it, it emerged through feudalism, through, through the progressive of impoverishment of the rush, uh, you know, the the lower strata of the population, if this naturally was done in authoritative ways, violent ways, a lot of wars and destructions, and uh, these were very ferocious uh, uh, theaters, definitely in terms of political and military practice. Um, but still, they contributed to, to develop in part these areas and to create more structured, structured domains. In turn, after this major kind of uh, um, fallout caused by the uh, devastating fallout caused by the Mongol invasion. Mm. Um, So the the power of the Russian princes for these two centuries of the, the end of the Middle Ages depended, therefore unavoidably, on the relation that they managed to establish with the Khan and the Mongol aristocracy. Um, and as we have seen, also the uh, the presence of such a great empire like the Golden Horde. The one of the Golden Horde didn't um, didn't eliminate actually the co the uh, the the political struggle within the Russian society. Uh, as we've seen before, the Russians still considered themselves as something unitary. They they looked at back the tradition of the Kievan Rus of the Russian Church. You know this legacy that they felt was extremely profitable to 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 collect to hand down, and it was considered kind of their founding uh, identity in in many ways so these are all concepts that have always been uh, have always greatly stimulated especially this kind of um, princely rules in the sense that um, your your power had to be strengthened has to be strengthened um, really individually speaking when you know the society is more egalitarian most of you know all, all the society is concerned just about you know having certain amount of autonomy uh, when not freedom and um trading uh, you know having you know individual 
business and so on when when you have this more centralized powers where everything also kind of depends on you as a prince as a as a um, uh, as a uh, I don't know I, I was saying despot but you know in that yeah let's say in the neutral term um, you need to strengthen your own prerogatives also through these ideological um, elements um, so uh, the race within the Russian mm, world for you know supremacy over the other entities was still very strong and the same Mongols were participating to it because naturally uh, they yeah of, of course they had this enormous influence on the area but they still this was still kind of a, of a big frontier so they were interested in keeping it at controlling it although it was difficult to do it also the Mongols had this geographical limit because the Mongols mostly ruled over the steppes when the forest when the world of the forest uh, begins they kind of had more troubles like the Mongols also had this military that was extremely uh, it was based chiefly on this uh, also great um, armies of uh, horsemen that could be uh, mobilized in, in huge numbers and they relied on this great uh, mobility and you know tactical dynamism um, and speed and so on but they needed space to maneuver they needed this great planes to, to fight well when the world of the forest began hmm, they were kind of more cautious more careful they the, the mongols had conquered russia um, but they had done it you know mostly in the open grounds on the open plains the regions of the great rivers they had invaded russian winter essentially also to, to pass through these frozen rivers because otherwise the you know russia is only in the spring when it, the ice melts is kind of a mess it gets marshy and we all know uh, how what the hell it is but the shared word of the forest is kind of something the mongols remain a bit out of which and that's where the russians kind of stuck in and kind of defended with their with all their means um that's why um why in spite of the great presence of of cavalry in the Russian armies and this time infantry were still very useful to defend all these kind of fortifications within the, the woods and so on and in fact Moscow can be seen ideally also as a bit of the symbol of this and this more kind of more detached decentralized world that however it's where these uh, Slavic presence kind of uh, in part together with naturally the, the rest of this uh, of this world kind of managed to, to build to carve um, you know, a space of power to eventually expand uh, all over and um, eventually against the same Tatars. Um, so the the Mongols were exercising a kind of indirect rule over a decentralized rule of most of Russia, naturally speaking, and definitely the Khans uh, had. I don't know if you take a city like Novgorod, uh, that was kind of. The Farmos, also the one that kind of resembled after the fall of Kiev, that, that is, this mostly um, kind of republican and mercantile um, um, community. You know, that Novgorod is, uh, in this sense, Moscow and Novgorod can be considered a bit of the antipodes of the, <laughs> the, the Russia. It was quite div diverse within itself, as you understand. Uh, Novgorod, be like this. City Republic of uh, wealthy merchants, um, quite not much about war, even though they had a consistent military organization as well. But it kind of resembled the the great centers of the time, of the age of the Kievan Rus. You know, this connected on, on this, you know, very important strategical position between the Baltic Sea and the the rivers and so on. Moscow instead, the sheer you know land, uh, terrestrial power based on principality, on the lordship, on this. Um, feudal mindset that eventually emerged as victorious else um, that was at that point the uh, really how the Russia was developing and and also a city like Novgorod kind of was developing uh, excuse me that was declining fast in many ways was not considered much good also for in terms of military um, uh, military uh, effectiveness also by foreign sources that may can be a, a stereotype actually we shouldn't um, a prejudice I mean it should have to look at, at it in detail but um, it, the, the military 
um, decline is always the the consequence of a of a greater fame, like a chiefly a political and social failure, not just strictly military one. So also in here, uh, it's interesting and to observe how definitely Russia one was ex you know fastly speeding in uh, and developing this um, feudal system as as the main and more convenient political and social uh, organization at that point. Um, or at least there were those classes like the, the, the nobility that had in that moment the means and the, the conditions for expanding unopposed their, their power in, in that form. Um, so the Russian princes kept competing militarily, the one against the other for reaching that um, authority, I would say that seniorate mm, um, that was connected with the title of Great Prince. So this title of Great Prince uh, was connected originally to whoever um, possessed Kiev mm, as the most important center of Russia at the time, but that after the um, the Mongol uh, uh, during the Mongol domination, the princes at this point were kind of uh, trying to 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 have it r recognized for uh, to them from the Khan of Sarai. Mm -hmm. um, so this this also happens all the time. I mean, the idea that when there is a sovereign authority, doesn't matter if it is you know, f how ambiguous it can be. I mean, naturally, the the great prince title in, in Kievan times was recognized as a very particular thing that now was also, you know, you know, went recognized by the Khanate of the Golden Horde was also changed in, 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 many, in many ways, ideally speaking. Um, but that's the point, you know, if you, if you have a stronger authority, this is typical of the Middle Ages, if you have a stronger authority, uh, that is recognized, that has this ability of ruling, of influencing, and so on, uh, you are going to automatically try to to get from it something. At least you're not the one that is on, you know, on the top of its list in terms of, you know, where's the, the next place you, the, it wants to, exp to expand in, <laughs> you know, you know, to fight against it. But everybody kind of tries to, to get also to participate a little bit to that power, and to to be recognized certain titles for their own their own benefit and it's exactly in this situation that Moscow manages to 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 rise um, to power because um, especially in the 14th century the um, princes of Moscow um, uh, had a very privileged r relation with the Khanate of the Golden Horde and they um, they the the Muscovite princes progressed towards the conquest of a stable superiority all the other um over the other members of the especially of the various ramifications of the um ancient princely princely rule um this is very important because The, the there had been also in the Kievan Rus this continuous kind of dynastic um, ideal for which all the Russian princes all descended from the same dynasty. So there was the um, the ideal that everybody was kind of fighting against the other because they recognized themselves as part of a great family to which. The inherit inheritance had to be split. Um, there had to be su official successors, and 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 this is what also complicated the story because it wasn't th these weren't just you know extraneous uh, principalities. They all shared. They were naturally they all inter their nobility or inter intermarried and so on. And this time, naturally, this nobility intermarried also with the Mongolian one extensively, and especially the the, uh, the dukes of Moscow they did um, um, at this point. Um, for example, when um, the Prince Ivan, in the first um, decades of the 14th century, um, 
obtained by the can and is um you know uh, th th basically even had led an army um a mongol army actually um th uh obviously with with russian contingents present against the city of twer mm -hmm. and this city had rebelled essentially to the tartar domain so even having led victoriously this expedition was granted by the Khan for him and his successors um, the right to collect through his own f functionaries, so his own Russian functionaries, um, in all the Russian principalities, mm, so in the whole Russian world, the tributes that were owed to the Golden Horde. So you can imagine what a, a huge amount of power this entailed because naturally these guys seize their own their own part of the share just you know as when you subcontract something you basically it's theoretically for free but you already know that that person is uh, scrape off from from the top um, it's normal this time the political practice is really it's really like this it's like the mob uh, the tribes are you know <laughs> the work really like that, um, but just think of what it meant um, to collect, in fact, this uh, share from the various, um, you know, from from the uh, from all Russian work from from all the princes. Naturally, this was all initially kind of theoretical, but you know, tributes at this point were kind of the um, main way to to interact between these powers. I mean the political thermometer was measured on the base of how many tribes you, you, you paid and w was recognized by um, superior superior and so on and, and this was also for the sake of protection I mean you pay a tribe to someone not just because you you are s subdued by it but also to receive um, uh, to receive aid against eventual enemies so it, it, it's as if it was a great clienterly society as a wall mm -hmm. But in the case of Ivan, that was pretty, pretty, uh, pretty evident. I mean, uh, was a very uh, important moment. Uh, even um, had it was essentially that the 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 sovereign that enabled the Duchy of Muscovy towards this uh, regional scale ascendancy. Mm -hmm. And Tver, the city, the northern city of Tver, had been in fact the the major rival of Moscow, and and that's how you see that basically you know the 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 Moscovites, being backed by the Mongols, seize, uh, re repressed Tver, and they uh, they managed to get this um, these privileges in return. So it's not that the Mongols were kind of just gifting them with design that they were rewarding them for a service they'd done for them and uh, that was very important because if they had not done it probably they would have lost the co special connection with the Moscovy um, uh, with m with Moscow and so on so it was a very delicate balance naturally as you can imagine it's never it's rarely uh, in history th it happens very rarely to to have a situation for which there is a power that literally does what 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 as it pleases it, and there is always this kind of balance that has to be maintained. The Tatars were evidently quite interested at this point of signing with Muscovy, and uh, and then they uh, kind of um, um, you know eventually the, the 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 situation was reversed in many ways, but. And this is the point that the great strength of Moscow was found uh, at this point, as Ivan was the uh, even first was reputed to be the, the richest and most powerful individual in Russia at this point. In fact, the, he was um, nicknamed like the Kalita, which means literally the money bag. <laughs> so he was full of money. Also, considering a very kind of poor world uh, in many ways, so this wealth was. Uh, really felt also as a uh, as a booster for for further um, expansion. In fact, uh, it's under Ivan that this uh, huge treasure is um, is used um, to finance the construction of stone churches in the Moscow Kremlin, among other things. But this also extended beyond the same 
uh, Moscow's territory as um, even purchased. Uh, so mm, without even the needing of, of, of making war for it, other lands in other principalities. Mm -hmm. Imagine also how you know fragmented the system was, how you know complicated, uh, how much you could play uh, at so many levels on these um, political hierarchies. You know, all the various vassals you could win over from someone else. You know, um, this is. In, what feudal Europe in in many ways uh, really really was in in political practice. Um, um, the same happened, for instance, instead under Basil uh, or Vasily, actually the the second that uh, ruled in later times from, uh, I think Vasily II was from uh, 1425 to 1462, so we are in the 15th century, but ne that's nevertheless very important because um, um, in here, naturally, m Moscow has already pretty much expanded, and it's at this point that um, uh, an ever greater um, number of members of the Mongol, the Mongol aristocracy um, instead put themselves at the service of the Muscovite prince. Mm -hmm. So also in here uh, you realize how it was nothing was so you know the balance was not so brutally reversed but it was very progressively uh, you know these mm, centers of power were kind of kind of Reequilibrating and and all these lords that existed in 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 the middle were you know passing from one center to another in terms of allegiance according to to the situation and many Tatar noblemen also were in this sense integrated in this way integrated into the uh, eventually into Muscovite um, uh, duchy as dressed uh, as uh, as if they had been Russian nobility. Um, together with them and whoever as we've seen heavily mixing also in marriage and so on because this was perfectly normal um, so the the rise of the the Moscow uh, the rise of Moscow was definitely supported by a uh, by other by very clever politics uh, in many ways a very, very a superior economical development of the region, uh, of a very um, scrupulous princely policy, and especially also by you know a, a, a discreet military mm, successes that you know military initiatives that um, widen progressively the the influence of this uh, domination and that. Um, could count not just on the uh, local nobility of the boyars, but also on the Russian church. And this this is important because the Russian church had, in in this sense, had had been protected also in here by the Tatars. Mm. It's very interesting. They, the Tatars had kind of left them alone. Um, the and on the contrary, had uh, um, uh, even they had even arrived at favoring the same Russian church by um, essentially exempting the ecclesiastical entities from the uh, the tributes that were normally owed to the to the horde and protecting their own properties um, honestly why this was done I'm not really aware why uh, because from one side actually the the Russian church was um, I mean if you look at the rise of, of, of Moscow you realize that the church there was a very strong alliance between the the Moscovite princes and the local church. Um, at this time, Moscow was also threatened by the Lithuanians. The Lithuanians had um, had a very uh, they had had a kind of wavering um, position in in into the Eastern European lands because they even what they joined with the um, uh, you know, with Poland in the, in the Commonwealth, they still kind of 
looked east and Lithuanians also launched several offensives on Moscow trying to, to wipe it out. So sometimes Moscow was really pressed from both sides, from the Lithuanians and the Tartars. And that's at this time that the, the church actually stuck to with the the uh, the Moscow uh, the Moscow princes. Um, so now I'm I'm actually don't uh, also don't have a great knowledge about the situation, but I suspect that the church was favored by the Tatars also, you know, uh, initially, especially during the, the beginning of fourteenth century, to support the Moscow as well. Probably there was also some other strategical reason. Probably I don't know the others for um, and please may correct me if I'm wrong. They thought that maybe supporting the church, they um, could uh, find another privileged interlocutor. It was also more um, genetically, let's say, more uh, kind of separated from secular politics. So this was not really true because definitely also in in, in Moscow, in excuse me, in, in Russia and and, and not. Um, not very different from from the rest of Europe, um, the uh, secular nobility was very strongly tied to the Russian Church. But this was a uh, to the Church. But this was uh, in the case of Russia. This also meant to take to have a control of a great part of the same Russian um, politics and society. So, given that the Church is in the sense a bit more of an impersonal figure because it's not an hereditary hereditary or private. Uh, dominion like a feudal um, a domain as 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 a uh, princedom is it it's something that basically lives on beyond these political entities um, that's why the Tartars probably also favored it um, hoping that their uh, you know that their support would pay them off for but I, f I suspect that the the relations were a bit more complex and kind of also more varying nevertheless there is this um, protection the Mongols um, carried out on, on, on the church and this um, as we have seen helped the the same Dutch of Moscovy indirectly and one of the brilliant, uh, most brilliant moves were definitely the one of Ivan who after having conquered the city of Vladimir um, he managed basically to to establish uh, permanently the metropolitan seat of Moscow. Now, also in here there is a great. Um, uh, there would be a lot of thing to say because um, they were there were many. Um, also, the Lithuanians at a certain point tried to subtract the uh, metropolitan seat from Moscow, from some from the mm, Russian church, so also in here it's a very complicated game, but the important th thing here with the conquest of Vladimir is that this city had been the place where the um, metropolitan of Kiev had uh, transferred uh, transferred in, in uh, had shifted basically the, the, ch the center of the of the Russian church. Mm. So s controlling this territory really equated to have a uh, a, a, um, a very great um, a very a control of, of on, on all the Russian church uh, in many ways. Um, and th in fact in, in the mid century the, the unification uh, also, of um, of the Duchy of Moscow with, with the one of Vladimir brought to the uh, to also to the fusion of the Moscovite title with as um, Duke of Vladimir and Moscow, and this was very important because Moscow had a bit this complex of having been a sort of newcomer, as Vladimir had um, a much more prestigious position in many ways um, than Moscow. Especially also in the hierarchy of possessions and of this because of this religious um, this religious uh, importance was definitely a uh, a very uh, profitable um, area to control for Moscow to eventually expand I in the rest of Russia and. And 
importantly enough, the, the Grand Duchy of Vladimir was recognized as an hereditary possession of, of the Moscow princes as well. Here the hereditarity of such domains was very very important in as um, these principalities were developing their control as as a very strongly personal possessions. It wasn't like um, in the past where it was this idea of greater you know kind of more public ideal um, and the, now the, the, the possessions want to be full and exclusive and and the episode of Vladimir was definitely one of the most important moments in, in the rise of the Muscovy in the mid 14th century so Moscow through this in fact he inherited the the uh, the legacy of the ecclesiastical and spiritual um, su uh, supremacy of Kiev, mm -hmm. and this is also what gave Moscow such a great authority because this is the indirectly through this um, now new dynastic possession the the Muscovite princes could represent a sort of r point of reference as the unitary um, religious centers of the whole Russia mm -hmm. and this was very deeply felt because as we've seen Russia was kind of being distanced from the Byzantine Empire enough to start claiming something more on its own also from a religious point of view um, the, uh, the the connections were Constantinople were still pretty much alive but naturally the, the Byzantine Empire at this point was declining pretty uh, rapidly um, and 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 also was facing a major crisis also with the Ottoman advance um, because essentially the especially the Byzantine emperors very different from the rest of the populations were trying to save um, the Empire by uh, kind of promising the uh, the Roman Church to proceed for a um, essentially a reconciliation or a reunification of the two churches after the sh uh, schism of the 11th century so all these measures naturally in this were not uh, basically uh, this were this was a mostly political an immediately political move because uh, the same Byzantine emperors knew perfectly that you know the uh, they were just obliged by the situation to search in help for help in, in the West um, in granting this uh, Roman primacy over over the church at that point and this is also what why certain Byzantines eventually preferred even the Ottoman Muslim the Muslim Ottoman rule to the to the Western one because they prefer at least we remain uh, Christian under the Muslims in, in our Orthodox way and and all this um, swinging was um, eventually this didn't serve because actually the reconciliation happened at the very end, um, but kind of was purely purely formal thing now. And 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 the Russians were kind of observing this from their own more or less remote perspective, um, and they saw that as a uh, general decline for which you know the the Constantinopolitan Church was basically couldn't be at that point in the, the center anymore of the orthodox world um, or at least they had to uh, basically cl um, claim um, also superiority um, on its own and and this th there was this progressive detachment of the metropolitan of Moscow from the Byzantine patriarch mm -hmm. and this is what gave origin uh, to the um, to the essentially to the create you know how important it is in in uh, it's been in, in Russian history this idea of being uh, kind of a even a center of, of of the church as such not just a merely you know national element as not at the time the concept of nationalism w wasn't there in the way we we mean it but at least this uh, Russia just say ethnical or linguistical or cultural as you want to call it a Russian identity but also 
the idea of being the the cent uh, of a say uh, the center is sacred authority based on this mm, Russian uh, on this Moscovite dynasty um, and it is um, in 1459 that the Russian church becomes uh, autocephalous mm. so it basically claimed um, the uh, according to the Byzant the same Byzantine tradition that the um, the, the metropolite at this time was um, confirmed by the great um, great prince of Moscow so essentially repeating this control that in the Byzantine Empire had existed from the secular authority on the uh, ecclesiastical one and this was also very important because as we have seen the church was extremely um, extremely powerful, extremely wealthy, and uh, having the chance to claim also, through the Byzantine tradition, a control over it from the political authority, from the secular authority, naturally meant to give an enormous prestige to uh, to the latter, and uh, and o consequently also a huge power on it, on, um, uh, on the world society. And Okay, so I don't know what I could add. There are actually so many things I could add. This was actually a very brief video <laughs> compared to to the usual, but I think it's uh, it was just to give a an idea, more or less, of what I I, I wanted to say. Uh, there are many events. There is the Great Feudal War in the 15th century. I mean, also the Battle of Kulikovo before in 1380. So many events. But today, I don't want to make a kind of an evidential history. It was just to look at broadly speaking at this at this system, how it started, what were the basic elements that brought to to the rise of the Duchy of Moscow in this uh, set of relations, also with the exter the outer and the uh, internal world. So for now, I'm just stopping here. I, I will definitely keep talking about these topics sooner or later. With, uh, with maybe we will make another video in which we'll see more in detail the, the phases of the expansion of the Duchy of Moscow towards the, um, I mean, the, the thresholds of the modern age in these last centuries of the Middle Ages, um, and also we'll keep talking about especially Russian, medieval Russian uh, military. Medieval Russian warfare, say uh, together with the ones of the the, the, the rest of the European countries. So for now, I just um, hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you are interested to my uh, to my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.